Okay. Okay, so we're gonna be live in a second. I already see, we already have uh, attendees. So there's one attendees at the moment, <laughs> but it's growing. Um, okay, so now I have the YouTube link. I'm going to put it, uh, I need to have the chat so I can send this over. Okay, so now you both have the YouTube link. And I'm going to start playing this. We said we're going to start at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock CET. So let's come back in eight minutes time. Yeah? Um, yeah, OK. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna mute everyone. And now I'll see you in eight minutes. OK. Yeah, OK.
Hi everyone, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. I'm El Slater, I'm uh, in Barcelona. Our speaker today, Ronan Bolik, is in Lausanne in Switzerland. And as usual, Dr. Sylvia Pan is behind the scenes, uh, making sure that everything works. So today I'm very happy to present in this Frontiers in Virtual Reality editor series, Ronan, Dr. Roland Bulik, and he's gonna speak on ensuring self-presence through embodied interaction in virtual reality. He's a senior scientist at EPFL in Switzerland. Uh, he uh, currently leads the Immersive Interaction Group from the School of Computer and Communication Sciences. He received his PhD, PhD in computer science in 1986 from Rennes in France and the habilita habilitation degree in computer science from the University of Grenoble in France in 1995. He's also a senior member of IEEE, ACM and a member of Eurographics. He's co-authored a large number of refereed publications, at least 140, and he's served on over 50 program committees of key conferences in graphics, animation, and virtual reality. So he studies experimentation and study of embodiment in VR, immersive interaction, inverse kinematics, motion capture, and quite a number of, uh, uh, of both technical aspects and things on the human interaction, human in interaction side. So I'm very happy to introduce him today and he's going to be speaking on the topic I, I mentioned before. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I will start sharing the screen. I suppose now everything is fine. And uh, thanks very much, uh, Mel, for this opportunity to present uh, my research. And uh, indeed, I will be focusing on uh, embodied interaction in immersive virtual reality. This is part of the work I've been conducting uh, since 2011 with uh, members of my team. But before that time, uh, I was part of the VR lab led by Daniel Palman. And I thought that as a kind of introduction, I would also make a little historical perspective of um, prior work related to virtual reality uh, done in that time period, in that time range. But first, the vision I have uh, with respect to our research topic is that embodied interaction, uh, we should leverage on this uh, ability we have to move skillfully in the world and to, as put by Paul Durish, uh, turn action into meaning. And because uh, excuse me, sorry, yeah. Renan, can I interrupt? There's a weird sound uh, next to your microphone. Can you see if the microphone has some, there's a sort of small feedback that, yeah. In the beginning it was fine, but then uh, after we came yeah. back. Oh, unfortunately it is, it is, that might be my uh, my my disk drive, the, the ventilator. Okay, can you move the microphone slightly away from it or it's kind of duty and you can't really change anything? Because when we uh, started it was, fine yeah yeah or we can leave with it <laughs> ah, because I, I didn't take the headset my mistake mm. Mm. okay i think i think it's fine it's not too disturbing so yeah i will uh, maybe speak a bit louder yeah that'll help yeah mm. thank you okay sorry for that indeed so uh, embodied interaction is really the key for um, that we want to leverage on and to put the full body to contribute to uh, computer mediated uh, activity. In our context, we focus on uh, activity where the full body avatar is necessary for performing um, action in the world. So the focus here will be special awareness in particular. And um, within that framework of uh, research direction, we, we want to explore to what extent the participants tolerates distortion to the avatar. And uh, we want to identify in this context where we should put the computational resources to smooth this experience, to, to make the avatar really, uh, really felt as being ourselves. And uh, as a first um, parenthesis, in terms of uh, leveraging of uh, um, 
embodied interaction. Here is a, a work we did um, in the last five years, and it, it takes advantage indeed on um, body skill. Uh, here is a very plain, simple one, uh, 2D graphic uh, strokes that are performed by an, an artist. But um, we, through this application, we, we felt we really put the focus on uh, leveraging on that skill so that the artist is still able to uh, produce uh, some content by uh, iterating on some um, on the design on the ongoing design as you can see here so we, it takes advantage of both of non-dominant hand for camera control and dominant hand for making these 2d strokes that are then converted into 3d uh, pause here, we move, we switch to the, uh, what the user is actually doing, uh, controlling a 3D character pose. Of course, this is not VR, but uh, through this tool, we see uh, two aspects of uh, algorithmic aspect. And the one we just saw now, the fact that the user can move uh, some uh, end effector of this 3D character inverse kinematic is also one uh, critical tool for uh, performing proper motion capture and avatar control in VR. And that's why I found uh, it would make sense to, to show this uh, prior work as an initial parenthesis. So um, beyond this short parenthesis, more related to computer animation, let's now move to the plan. I will give uh, a brief overview of some um, motion capture, uh, embedding the user in, uh, in a virtual reality for, uh, done in, um, in the virtual reality lab uh, led by Daniel Taman, but more uh, historical perspectives. And the two other parts, key uh, main part will be uh, focusing on embodiment in VR, current work. And um, um, the last part will make a link a bit with computer animation. How can we impersonate uh, a 3D character that is different from ourselves? This will end my talk. But first, this historical perspective. So back in 1999, uh, at the time, we were using uh, magnetic sensors, as we can see on the left, with a participant equipped with a sufficient uh, number of those sensors, one per body uh, segment. And with proper calibration, we would um, collocate the avatar with the participant, resize uh, this avatar to the participant size, and of course, in the first initial stage, compute and store uh, local transformation linking the, each of these um, uh, sensor to the local uh, joint coordinate system. Then at runtime, um, the difference uh, of the um, transformation reported by the sensor compared to the transformation uh, initially um, stored at calibration time. From this information, uh, we either drive a single joint, such as here for the uh, shoulder, or uh, this information would be uh, distributed over multiple joints. Where does that make sense? Uh, in particular for the spine, that where we end up with much more realistic uh, movement such as those uh, illustrated here on the right and we, it will be more visible uh, when the um, this is actually an actor yes is moving the torso like this or in the next uh, sequence he moves uh, on the side so that was done with uh, some uh, magnetic sensor, and this is more motion capture. And um, let's move on to uh, the next step. What can we do with that beyond capturing movement in real time? We can actually uh, build some interaction where a user equipped in the same way as um, in the previous uh, slide with magnetic sensors uh, is able to perform not only a set of uh, gesture posture but also of action such as locomotion uh, or some body movements that can be uh, that are predefined it's that can be um, analyzed on the flight so the 
instantaneous uh, polls and uh, velocity of the user can be filtered through uh, from coarse to fine to fine grain filters so that this uh, process is quite fast and the system is able to know what is the user actually currently performing this allows to to allow to run some simple script so without any without the balls here where uh, all the non-player character behavior was driven from the currently recognized uh, action but of course we cannot go uh, very far into uh, this direction that's why it has not been moved much more and in addition um, at the time the technology of uh, magnetic sensors uh, was poised and I think is still quite poised with the distortion and that's why this reduced uh, interaction quality. Then we move to um, the next step by using uh, optical uh, active markers to um, that uh, delivers absolute 3D uh, sensor location and from that information and based on prior work in inverse kinematic for uh, aimed, aimed at computer animation. This is a second application of this um, algorithmic work in uh, IK, uh, so-called uh, Jacobian-based IK. Uh, what's nice about this uh, technology of inverse kinematic, it's, it's possible to assign a priority to those constraints you want to uh, achieve. And one of which is, of course, reconstructing the full body posture given the uh, clouds of dots provided by the mock-up system. But Beyond this, we want also uh, to study spatial awareness in particular, where the, the avatar might uh, have to evolve in complex virtual environments. So how can the system um, take in charge collision avoidance? So collision avoidance would be uh, done where, whenever there is actual interpenetration. But uh, through this work we've done um, uh, in those papers, uh, we even are able to anticipate obstacles. If you notice, obstacles are in green, around those obstacles are some uh, region, and whenever a body part is uh, moving within this region and moving close or closer to an obstacle, you may notice some little red lines, which means that on the fly, the system is uh, dynamically creating constraints that will um, damp the movement of those body parts and those this is combined with the body reconstruction ensuring not only the body reconstruction but also um, a smooth integration of the avatar uh, movement in the virtual environment so that was for a small uh, historical perspective of those prior work in uh, vr lab let's move on to the work now more uh, related to the question of embodiment and uh, briefly uh, let me briefly recall the terminology of vr so presence being the subjective response of the human to the environment as how much does this person participant feel as being here and the issue is uh, not easy to measure and it's rather through the behavior uh, whether this participant is behaving according to what would be done in reality that is a quite good criteria and uh, in 2009, Amel also proposed uh, to distinguish uh, this presence into place illusion, whether we feel we are there, or plausibility illusion, whether the interaction uh, is plausible. And here, I would say, is more uh, in line with social interaction that we are not doing. Uh, here, um, I recall another um, approach to um, decompose, decompose presence into three components three components, the physical presence, so this is whether uh, we are there. Self-presence is indeed uh, linked to what we are interested in now, um, embodiment, to what extent uh, do I feel that I have a virtual body actually present in the virtual environment. And social presence is a third component that I myself have not been uh, investigating, but of course is very important too, and I've been uh, explored a lot. So, if we focus now on embodiment, we uh, will uh, use the terminology introduced by Kiltegi and Slater uh, with uh, 
body ownership, to what extent is this avatar body, this virtual body uh, considered as my own body, agency, to what extent is the movement of this avatar, uh, do I feel it, it is under my control, under my will, and self-location is, uh, to what extent do I feel I'm located within this body, as my own body. So, of course, uh, when we arrived uh, and started to work on embodying many prior works, such as of Kokinara, had been done. And that's why uh, one of the first questions we have been interesting to investigate was um, the question of the viewpoint. Whether is that such an important uh, criteria to be collocated within the body, the first person viewpoint? Is that necessary to ensure embodiment? So that was intriguing us, and that's why we, we conducted with uh, Enrique Galvan de Barra a first study on this um, question, focusing on the viewpoint, the location. Uh, so um, the setup was the following. We see uh, a participant here equipped with uh, this uh, optical motion capture. The setup um, would have some sphere one at a time appearing randomly in the neighborhood of the participant and um, the participant would either interact to reach uh, the sphere that just uh, appeared either in the third person uh, perspective such as here uh, viewed here in the top image or in the first person perspective and um, the user participant is free to reach the sphere target either with a hand or with a feet. As you can see, some of them are quite low. And uh, we have been able to use um, a fast analytic IK, so a different technology than the one presented before. Uh, indeed, uh, one limitation of Jacobin based IK is computing cost. And here uh, we really wanted to have a very reactive uh, uh, system and to ensure optimal agency. This was uh, one critical aspect of the. That's why we came. We went into uh, using the analytical IK uh, done by Erai Mola. Um, in this video, uh, you could see here in the forefront. This is a subject. The subject actually is wearing a HMD. So this is what the subject is seeing in the HMD. And this in the background is a large screen for the operator to control what the subject participant is viewing. And what are the results? And um, to our surprise, actually, um, um, we found no significant difference between the first person viewpoint and the third person viewpoint. So between these two uh, conditions with it, uh, across which we thought we might have uh, some um, such important significant difference. Uh, there was significant difference, but of course, between the standard um, condition where the system is running fine with proper agency and the condition, the asynchronous condition where we introduced one second delay um, for the captured movement. And that's uh, show that the system is actually moving. We are actually uh, measuring uh, the proper um, quantity such as here agency. So we have uh, the user feel that he or she is in control when synchronous uh, synchronicity is ensured and not when it is asynchronous. Likewise, body ownership, the participants do feel they own this body when the system is uh, in the synchronous condition and not when it is asynchronous. But within the synchronous uh, condition, notice within the first and third person condition for a viewpoint, uh, there is a um, little difference. And um, the same for body ownership. And this was not uh, actually uh, our initial hypothesis. Um, and uh, or, um, we think that uh, actually the high quality agency ensured by such uh, motion capture, full body motion capture, may explain that even, um, even if we are not moving in, as in the first person viewpoint, we still uh, can 
ensure uh, body ownership and agency. This has been confirmed in a follow-up study where we wanted to uh, introduce a, a third uh, condition. So not only first-person viewpoint, third-person viewpoint, but also an alternate, an alternance of first and third uh, person viewpoint within the same um, session of interaction. And for this, we have reproduced uh, the famous uh, virtual pit uh, demo, so introduced by uh, in 2002, co-authored by Mail, in particular, and where uh, in this context we were measuring galvanic skin response, in particular, uh, to assess whether there was uh, induced stress in this in this context, and the result are the following again. Um, here, notice it's no more uh, synchronous and, uh, or asynchronous. Instead of introducing, introducing a delay for the control condition, uh, we, we have recorded um, a prior movement of the subject and this movement was played back. So in the incongruous um, condition, the control condition, the um, subject could move, but it was not taken into account. We would play back the, uh, the pre-recorded movement. So it had, the subject had actually no control. And again, here, what, what we see is in the congruent uh, context, uh, there is no uh, significant difference between first person viewpoint, third person viewpoint, and this uh, new uh, condition where we can, the subject is asked to alternate between both first and third person viewpoint. And uh, in the incongruous, uh, incongruent uh, condition, we see uh, here uh, clearly uh, a difference between the third person viewpoint and the first person viewpoint. So there can be such a difference here. Um, with respect to the um, stimulation, the fact that uh, the stress level was actually well replicated and this was um, assessed here, um, both the first person viewpoint and the alternate alternation of first and third uh, had similar, uh, elicited similar uh, galvanic st skin response, stress level, uh, and there was a, there, there was a, a difference with the third person viewpoint. So indeed, um, by using the alternating uh, approach, we take advantage of both conditions. We have the first person viewpoint where we, we feel as if we were collocated with the uh, avatar. And whenever we move in the third person viewpoint, this is uh, generally uh, benefit the experience by providing a broader view of the scene, a better understanding of what is happening. So third person viewpoint can have also some uh, quite interesting uh, uh, property too, that is nice to have in VR. Then we moved up to um, assess um, distortion. So the question here is knowing that motion capture won't be perfect, especially in uh, such context of real time interaction. Um, to what extent uh, are, is the user sensitive to those distortions introduced by a mocap system? And uh, that's why we uh, have uh, designed with MIT Galvan de Baba this simple uh, setup where the participant is um, tasked to uh, bring the hand from a starting point to a target point and uh, randomly uh, this, this movement will be either facilitated or hindered or it uh, won't uh, be um, manipulated. So the three possibilities are uh, randomly, uh, will randomly occur. And as you can see, immediately after performing each individual trial, there is a pop in a fourth choice question. Here we see the, the user just experience a hindered uh, case and now, again, we see um, the opposite case where it has been facilitated. So um, an illustration of those three cases. So 
no distortion, uh, exact replication of a virtual hand where collocated with a real hand, less effort. Uh, the virtual hand reached the target before, and when there is more effort, the real hand has to move more so that the virtual hand reach the target. And uh, what was interesting is through this uh, experience experiment is that uh, we noticed um, quite a broad tolerance to distortion and in particular some asymmetry of the user um, when the user report uh, whether he felt or not uh, such distortion. Indeed, whenever the system is helping us, the users, we tend to not notice it. We feel it's us, we are doing well. But as soon as we have to do a little more effort, uh, whenever the context is hindering, then uh, we are very sensitive to this uh, additional effort we have to perform. Then we will notice it quite uh, quicker than the opposite. Following on this um, research on embodiment, then we were uh, interested to assess whether contact and self-haptic in particular uh, had an influence about uh, user experience in VR. So we all know that haptic feedback is particularly difficult to implement in VR. Uh, whenever there is a, we want to synthesize the um, interaction with a virtual object or obstacle, we need a mechanical system. And we've seen a very nice talk from Massimo Bergamasco on this topic. But here we don't have such device. And um, instead we'll um, explore uh, one uh, haptic feedback that is quite cheap, quite easy, because it's our own body that provides this haptic feedback, self-haptic feedback, is happen whenever the user avatar uh, enter in contact, uh, two pa body part of the user enter in contact. And of course, if the correspondence between the user body parts match uh, the virtual body parts, then this is the ideal case. We feel um, a congruent um, visual tactile feedback. The sense of touch, because one body part is touching another body part, is matching what we see. We see those two uh, body parts uh, touching each other. But what if this is not uh, ensured? What if um, we feel that two parts of our body are in contact, such as the hand with the body, with the belly, or the hand with the thigh. We feel that, we know it through uh, uh, interoception. And, uh, but visually, there is a gap. And this is what we have uh, investigated here. So the context um, that we have uh, explored was uh, what happened whenever um, the participant feels two body parts are in contact, but he sees that there is a gap. There is no virtual contact between those virtual avatar body parts. And we wanted to see whether this had an, inc an, in an impact on other, um, on the agency also. So we combined this uh, study the impact of the visual tactile discrepancy with um, another distortion we introduced for movement in free space as illustrated here. So it was um, a different distortion compared to the one of uh, the previous study by Enrique Galvan de Boba. Here we see uh, movement performed by a subject without distortion. Here we see that the user movement is amplified. So it's amplified with respect to the body surface. Whenever the hand of the user is in contact with the body, there is no uh, distortion. But as the movement of the, the hand is getting further from the body surface, it's either amplified or here it is reduced in this 
for the purpose of the experiment we have conducted here, we only use the amplification distortion. So participants were either moving the hand from this starting point on the tie towards this target or from the belly towards this target and back. And whenever we had a congruency, congruency we would see uh, that the avatar hand would be in contact with the thigh of the avatar and, or the belly. And uh, incongruent uh, context would be there would be a gap and through a bi piloting uh, we have uh, determined that, uh, that the gap would be seven centimeters. So in the incongruent case we have a gap of seven centimeter although the, um, there is an actual contact. So, and we've seen, again, we've asked to a uh, user, to participant, whenever they were performing each trial, whether they felt embodied, so body ownership, or they were feeling in control of the movement of this avatar agency. And we can see here through this um, agency score, so the congruent case is uh, whenever the, there is correspondence of the user posture and the avatar posture, in particular for the contact. And um, here on the x-axis is the um, intensity of the, dis of the distortion of the movement in free space. So this is amplification of the movement either no amplification, so normal movement, or small or high amplification of the movement. And notice that in the congruent case, the agency score remains quite high even whenever there is a high amplification of the movement. But in the incongruent case, whenever there is this gap, visual gap that uh, shows me there, there is some inconsistency from what I see and what I feel, then even without um, movement amplification already from the start, it has an impact on agency. Agency is still above dot uh, five, around dot six, but uh, what is in particular important is, is it dec degrades quite fast um, as a distortion uh, increase. And this, if we uh, combine all those uh, measurements and we retain only uh, ownership, we can see also with respect to ownership that in the incongruent case, we have a dramatic uh, loss of ownership whenever there is such gap, so such mismatch into um, the um, proprioceptive uh, feedback. And what is the message here is indeed, if we have some resource to put into uh, computation, into the motion capture of uh, users, is, uh, is that we have to put this resource into ensuring uh, self-contact uh, properly, without, of course, interpenetration either, but also without gaps. And this, uh, unfortunately, is uh, far too often uh, not well uh, enforced uh, with nowadays uh, motion capture uh, um, system. And that's why now I move to um, the last part that indeed uh, want to address this kind of issue. So more on the algorithmic side here, there is no more uh, um, embodiment study in that part, although that would be quite interesting. And what is the context of this problem we want to now uh, address is uh, as you can see here, uh, we have on the left a participant equipped with a mocap equipped uh, system, optical. And uh, whenever we want to map this movement onto a target uh, character that may be different in terms of size, proportion, and in that case, in particular, uh, volume, uh, a naive mapping, even with some uh, normalization, um, is not sufficient. That's why we've been working on a representation of the posture that indeed um, 
aim to reduce such uh, inconsistency. And why do we want to address this? As we've seen before, um, to ensure a proper uh, visuotactile uh, feedback for participants of uh, VR uh, experience. But also, whenever we, we move, we, we express a lot of information, semantics, through body posture over time. We speak with hands and so on. And, uh, by uh, ensuring a proper retargeting from source participant to target character, we will also retain uh, semantic information across this remapping, uh, across characters. So, and uh, basically I won't enter into detail, but um, indeed joint angles are not sufficient to encapsulate um, the posture so that it can be transmitted uh, with the semantics, we have to um, we take advantage uh, of um, a method introduced by Alaska and Komura, uh, relying on uh, vectors that locate any all body part with respect to all other body parts. So this set of vector has been used. But in addition to Alaska work, we introduce some renormalization uh, so that the mapping. Um, uh, transfer well across character. But in addition, we also introduce um, some half space uh, constraint, half plane constraint, uh, whenever the posture has some uh, layering of body parts to ensure a proper transfer of such layering of body parts. So I rather move the, show the result. So it is not only uh, a method that is addressing the mapping for um, whenever there is contact. The method is working for the whole posture and gesture space. It, it works over the continuum of the posture space, as we can see on the top. So uh, this is Let's let's take this one and show this one. Here we can see the performance on the left and on the right. Uh, two hands here are in contact, which is one of those aim we had a strong requirement. Um, I notice a small latency, but notice that uh, the, the participant here is mapped to onto five target characters. So how do we evaluate uh, such uh, IK, such uh, motion retargeting, real-time motion retargeting um, technology? So we ask an actor to perform some uh, short video uh, of uh, very recognizable uh, actions, uh, either dance posture or very fast movement or uh, movement involving self-contact in particular and the user study was organized so that the participant of the user study would view the video clip on the left and in a randomized order um, the reconstructed the retargeted um, result by our method and two other methods from the state of the art as we can see here samples of course for convenience of uh, viewing this video, the order of the method is the same for all the snippet, but for the user studies, these, these were randomized. And these are the kind of um, sequences the user had to assess, and the answer they would rate how faithful is the retargeted video to the original uh, movement. And you've noticed uh, various characters. So there is uh, the child that has different volume from the and body size from the initial performer. The woman might have a human uh, proportion and size similar to the initial performer. So this was a standard case. And the alien has different uh, proportions in particular. So that makes uh, an additional difficulty for, for that case. And I will now move on to show the result for the sake of 
time. And uh, overall, um, so the methods we propose were found uh, to have a significantly higher rates, uh, quality rates compared to the two other from the state of the art, uh, including the one that was relying on those uh, vectors already. But the fact that we introduced an additional normalization uh, was uh, in particularly important for um, characters that had different proportions, such as different volumes, such as the child, different proportions, such as the alien. That's where we made the difference with this uh, vector method relying on vectors. And whenever um, the method was using, um, working on the woman character, same proportion as human proportion, then we had no significant difference. So based on this type of uh, technology, now we expect and we wish to move on and uh, we are able to uh, encapsulate the poster semantics and transfer it on a wide range now of uh, arbitrary character, provided they are humanoid-like, I must say. Um, but this is possible in real time. This is not an offline a posteriori uh, uh, complicated, uh, heavy uh, computation. This happened as it is performed, and that's why it has, uh, I feel, a potential in for some VR uh, application, whatever, to make the experience of the participant more fun. Why not uh, um, having this ability to impersonate a, a target character that they want to uh, live through? And we know this might have a, a strong effect on the, on the participant um, behavior after all, afterwards, such as uh, we know the Proteus effect in VR. And there are, of course, many other possibilities uh, is worth leveraging on this technique. So let's move on to a short conclusion now. Um, so what are we uh, currently doing? This, what I've shown was not the um, last work we are doing. Actually, we have been studying uh, with uh, Thibaut Porsu, uh, PhD, who is finishing this year, um, the tolerance of participants to dynamic uh, distortion. So the, here, instead of reaching a, a still target, the target is moving and uh, we introduce a mechanism that want to help the participant to achieve this difficult uh, task of uh, reaching a dynamic target, but we don't want the participant to notice it because as soon as participant may uh, notice uh, this distortion that want to help, then this may decrease the motivation to, to actually do a task. And if this is a rehabilitation, maybe uh, um, it can be detrimental to the proposed experience. Uh, we have also uh, been exploring together with uh, Thibault uh, another family of a potential uh, proprioceptive discrepancy. Uh, instead of uh, exploring the self-contact as we've done before, um, here we explored to what extent does reaching a joint limit such as the uh, elbow full extension does that can that be detrimental for um, the embodiment dimension would that generate some break in embodiment this is a kind of question that uh, Thibault is also have been addressed uh, beyond this uh, body of work we also target uh, study on cyber sickness uh, sorry, uh, missing R. Um, whether we can detect it and if we can detect it, uh, whether how we can uh, adjust the system dynamically so that it uh, reduces such issue. And in our context, uh, we are also part of a study that take advantage of uh, fMRI uh, device. And that's why in this context of fMRI device, um, the participant is in a lying down posture 
And within this context, we have been uh, also aiming to characterize whether we are more likely to become uh, cyber sick or motion sick. And this is also some uh, ongoing work. Uh, application wise, we feel that indeed uh, all these tools we've been studying can be quite interesting for training skill um, in particular skills involving the full body where spatial awareness as uh, is particularly important uh, rehabilitation being one of them and uh, the last um, technology i was presenting we do feel this can ease and uh, uh, help the production of 3d content for 3d characters for example so, and I guess uh, that should end it. And thank you very much for, for your attention, uh, available for uh, your question. Here is a brief uh, overview of members of the team, current team, but of course there would be much more name if I had to uh, put also the author from prior research at the time of the VR lab or the LIG. And uh, you can find uh, papers, um, code and demos uh, on our website on www.ig.epfl.ch. On this, I think I should now give back the floor to Sylvia. Okay, I'm going to um, bring back now. Yeah. Thanks very much for a very interesting talk that's full of a lot of useful information, both for people who work on the technical side and also for people who work on, if you like, the scientific side of understanding people's responses to virtual reality. So some questions are coming through that people watching on YouTube, please post your questions on the chat and um, people on Zoom, please post your questions on questions and answer. So the first question is from Ewin Lavoie, who says, great talk. And he wonders, is there a falling off point for embodiment that will make someone feel embodied enough? Or do you think this will continue to get better as we get more precise ways of aligning touch and vision? Um, I'm not sure I get the concept of falling off point, but what is sure through exp or experience across uh, all the study we made is we notice this broad variance uh, across uh, participants that it can they, can they can react in a very different way across participants. We may at, in the end uh, come up with some threshold that on average is representative to our um, tolerance to some distortion, but we have really to, to be um, conscious that uh, from one participant to the next, there should be actually a calibration process uh, that indeed would uh, aim to identify, I suspect, such um, falling off point. Um, and um, well, is the technology ready for that? Uh, <laughs> Yet, you've seen we, we use rather a um, high-end uh, motion capture system and uh, that because we need the precision uh, provided by this phase space and optical motion capture. Of course, we, we do uh, think at some point there will be a transition towards using um, trackers from HTC. The technology will go, become mature enough to ensure a proper real-time motion capture with this device. And of course, in the background, my assumption is that over time, we'll see more and more learned models through machine learning that will be trained with a huge database that will ensure a smooth um, movement production from those potentially limited set of uh, trackers. Yet we are not there, unfortunately. Thanks. There's um, a follow up to that question from Jack Ratcliffe. He says, hello, building on you in suggestion. Do we think that as people get used to better embodiment hardware, it will make previous embodiment hardware less effective? 
in terms of hardware, well, if we raise the bar, indeed, it becomes part of the culture and what we used to have in the past uh, suddenly becomes, uh, yeah, kind of uh, outdated. I think, of course, we should expect that as technology increase, improve and as the population get accustomed to this kind of experience, uh, the first time they will be uh, greatly excited and uh, thrilled, but maybe it, this might erode uh, over time, I suspect. Yeah. Um, there's a, a further question by Ewan Lavoie, who asked the first one. He said, uh, he says, I research eye-hand coordination in virtual reality and suspect that with object interactions, if the haptic feedback is close enough without rigorous inspection by participants, embodiment would develop. Words is saying that some level of approximation may be good enough. I'm not sure I got the question. Okay, so, so he's saying if the haptic feedback corresponding with the visual is close enough, good enough, without rigorous inspection by participants, in other words, they're not looking for anything to go wrong, they're just experiencing, do you think there'd still be body ownership in that case? I think uh, indeed priming can be very important. If a participant suspects something will be wrong, there, there will be much more attentive. Uh, attention is indeed something we can manipulate. And if the participant is focusing on something uh, not especially related to this uh, quality of contact or um, haptic interaction. If you design the experience in such a way that, yeah, the, you divert the attention towards what you want and not the defect. Uh, but this we require some, some, I would say, design experience. Mm -hmm. Thanks. There's a question from Jerome de Pietro. He says, what's the best way of solving the problem of a user's hand pushing through a wall in virtual reality and going through it? Some experiences show a ghost image of the user's tracked hand, while the avatar's hand is shown as stopped by. Is this the best way to do it? Any other recommendations? At the moment, indeed, I would uh, re uh, recommend this, uh, what was described at least um, the virtual hand being stopped uh, by the virtual obstacle. Indeed, this will introduce a proprio visual proprioceptive discrepancy because uh, my real hand won't match actually uh, the virtual hand and even through the movement. But there have been quite a lot of work from UNC um, about how to mitigate this kind of effect. Um, Let's say if my real hand is moving uh, back, uh, then there have been a method proposed by a um, member of the team over there that would move also back the virtual hand, but not as much as the real hand. So, so that there is some relative coherence between real hand and virtual hand movement. They don't move as much, they don't move exactly by the same quantity, but um, in the retraction phase. Uh, but this is, uh, I think, one um, dimension to think about. What should you do when the real hand is moving backward towards uh, being out of this virtual obstacle? Thanks. So, uh of Salamancas asks says great talk have you studied have you studied the impact of physical appearance in embodiment most of your examples were related with movement uh, no uh, we we have not been uh, exploring uh, appearance i've seen uh, some recent paper from uh, Henri Arren uh, from actually VR 2020 where Actually, they compared uh, the relative importance of um, viewpoint control and appearance, and they showed that uh, appearance seems not to be the main factor and control being the main factor. That's why I think control is will remain our focus for sure for some time. Um, appearance being uh, seems uh, less important for the quality of the user experience. 
Yes, and I, I, that conforms with our findings over, over many experiments that the appearance is less important than the movement. Um, but of course, we don't know because what would happen if you had really, really, really perfect representation, but we're not there yet. Um, uh, Sylvia wants to ask a question. Do you want to come on and ask it directly? Okay, sure. It's just a um, yeah, low level question really about, um, uh, you know, now VR becoming a more kind of consumer market thing. And uh, I see most people now basically have their self avatar driven by basically three trackers, the head tracker and the two hand trackers, right. But actually, there are also lots of people, for instance, using HTC uh, with additional trackers as well as in a consumer based application, they use this app called VR chat. And they kind of live on VR chat and they, they kind of compete with each other with dance movement and all things like that. So I kind of see a big range of different, uh, uh, you know, consumer kind of, you know, uh, using self avatars. So in your opinion, how many trackers, you know, is enough? Is it sort of good enough for basic, maybe social interaction? And how many trackers do you need for more sort of sophisticated spatial tasks? Um, do you have any any thoughts on that? Like obviously we're talking about six off uh, trackers. Yes, yes, indeed. Mm. And, uh, and also, sorry, and also another question is where to place them, right? I can have two <laughs> additional trackers. Where do you think, if I have say three trackers, if I buy one additional more, where do I put it? If I have two additional more, where else do I put it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I would put um, at least one more, but rather at the waist level, hip level. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then if so you we want, don't, we don't need a chest one. I would put the the next one on the chest, yeah, mm. so that uh, it, it it can help for uh, shoulder control, yeah. Mm. It, it, yeah. Uh, ideally, um, very often when we want to go to higher end uh, quality of the motion capture, uh, there is this. Uh, quite visible limitation of um, clavicle <laughs> tracking. If you don't track the clavicle or if you mm. do this kind of movement, yeah. Uh, yeah. the avatar very often um, yeah. animate yeah. only the shoulder and does not animate the clavicle. And this is visually so um, yeah. tracking. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so for higher end um, quality of this uh, upper body, there should be something uh, allowing to track uh, this region mm -hmm. that you, you're able to replicate uh, this type of movement. But I noticed, after all, for social interaction, very often you, you don't use that, uh, this region, this body region mm -hmm. that much. So it's- When I do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe that you should learn it uh, through, uh, to some model, yeah. Mm, yeah, because like actually this is really interesting because by default a lot of people when they have additional trackers, chest is obvious thing, but lots of people are actually putting one on the elbow, which I think actually with, with inverse kinematic, you can kind of get that, especially if you have this one being sixed off, you, you don't really need the elbow tracking, right? So this is really low priority. Yeah, this is a lower priority. Most mm. of the time we can, uh, yeah, forget this one mm. only if you are in a cluttered environment where uh, you the, the have fine the awkward movements. Of the person, mm, yeah, mm. Uh, yeah. is necessary. Then you would add something to locate the elbow. Otherwise, mm. uh, again by training a model through uh, the six off of the health controller, the this mm -hmm. should be uh, fine. Sufficient for most of the case, yes. Yeah, and by training, do you think like there are quite a lot of in individual differences or I could train a model with one person which should hopefully apply to majority of participants, of users as well? So that's a good question because uh, I'm not sure I've seen published uh, model for that. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there exist some that mm. are um, private. Um, mm. There was this, uh, I think it's Nick Samuel that was doing something quite high end with a limited number mm -hmm. of um, trackers, but uh, this was not um, Nick Samuel, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank are, you. Are you okay? Yeah. Thanks. Are, are you okay to answer three more questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so from Carlos Maranez, 
He says, nice talk. When studying different perspectives in the sense of embodiment, do you think that larger and distances decrease the sense of embodiment? So, uh, experience showed in the very first um, um, result paper uh, shown from Enrique Galdrón de Barba, we had this uh, third person compared to first person in this uh, rich task for these uh, targets that were appearing randomly and um, there was for that case uh, no uh, decrease in the embodiment quality um, but of course if you go further and, and further apart um, what you will lose indeed is precision because as the more the further you go the less precise you are able to determine uh, what you should do locally with your hands, with your limb, uh, or you should act locally uh, in your local environment. If your third person viewpoint is quite far, you lose precision. And you may even, um, your own body may um, hide what the part of the env environment you want to, to use. So. We have not explored this parameter of uh, the third person viewpoint because in most of the study like ours, we have a single third person viewpoint, although there is an infinite number of such third person uh, possible viewpoints. Indeed, that would be interesting to um, explore whether uh, the distance as suggested here uh, uh, decrease the embodiment because to feel embodied, you um, we showed that agency is important. So you have to be able to move according to your will. Okay, you can do that with uh, correct motion capture, but you should also achieve some task. And if this task is actually um, interacting with the environment, pick and place or this, whatever, then if you are quite far, then you are not really able to, to see your local environment properly and to achieve the task correctly. So it's more through the achievement of whatever you want to do that you may um, feel this distance, increased distance as detrimental to the quality of the interaction. But yeah, indeed interesting to, to explore. Thanks. Um, Jerome Di Pietro uh, has a follow-up question. He said, rather than body trackers, would iPhone facial capture driving facial blend shapes not be better for social interaction? So indeed, for I, I've been focusing a lot on full body interaction and now, uh, although I didn't mention it, we are interested in finger uh, addition, adding the finger interaction. But whenever you want to go for application in VR, uh, social networks um, is more um, should leverage more on facial expression, facial, because it has been shown from through many studies that uh, we convey much more information through facial expression uh, than through body posture, for example. So if you want to go through social interaction, social networks, this kind of stuff, this person is right to put the focus on um, capturing facial expression better than the state of the art. I know it's improving uh, in the HND nowadays. We, they, they're aiming at uh, capturing the lower face movement or even within the HND capturing the eye movement or the eyebrow movement. We are going in the right direction for VR uh, for such social uh, interaction. Indeed, but it is not really our focus, I would say. We, we are more into body and um, action <laughs> than social. This answers um, both Daniel Salamanca and Jerome de Pietro both wanted to know if you're doing any studies on facial tracking in any way. And I think you kind of answered that. Yes, indeed, yeah. No, this is okay. not our focus, yeah. But okay. finger finger tracking, how to 
explore this question of retargeting on a finger, um, for example, and how do we feel embodied through uh, finger interaction? These are questions we now explore. Okay, actually there's still two more questions. You're able, okay to do those? Yes, yes. Okay, so from Pierre Baudin, he says, uh, hi, thank you for the nice talk. Did you try other kinds of threat towards the body in the study of first person and third person perspective? Do you think it might show different results? Um, actually, we didn't... Ah, yeah, you mean the virtual pit. Uh, yes, yes. Threat. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we didn't explore alternative uh, apart from the, the virtual pit, yes. Okay. And the last question then, um, this is from Anna Sig Sigal. Uh, she asks, um, but it, she says embodiment is something more than just sensory. It has to do with neural involvement. What are the features that can fool our brain into embodiment? Hmm. I end up with an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there is a whole body of work on this question of embodiment that are conducted also in EPFL and you may know Bruno Erdolin from LNCO and Olaf Blanke and indeed we are collaborating with them. They are our um, support for answering this kind of question. We are more on the algorithmic technical side and fortunately we can interact and all these years uh, I've been leading the immersive interaction research group this was uh, through a close collaboration with Bruno Erdelin and Olaf Blanke that really helped us to, to design the proper experience to, to ask the right questions. And um, so what are the features that can fool our brain into embodiment? Uh, I think uh, the, the most important for me is agency that uh, this um, this avatar is moving faithfully. Um, this is a, the most strong um, feature that I would um, put in place for ensuring embodiment. Thanks. Okay, so thank you once again for a really in, uh, enlightening talk and full of very, very useful information. So the you know, one thing you can't have is hearing all the audience clapping Thanks. for them sure they are. So thanks again. Um, thanks before we close, this, uh, thanks sorry. For this seminar series. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so before we close, I'll just make some announcements. So first of all, thanks to Dr. Sylvia Pan for helping out as, mm -hmm. as usual. Mm -hmm. And to next, the next meeting is Frank Stenike, who's going to speak on virtual reality interaction in blended reality spaces on the 17th of June at four o'clock, uh, that's Brussels time, CEST. And one thing that's not on the webpage yet is the final session will be 24th of June at four o'clock, Brussels time. And this will be a panel, um, including members of industry and so on, about the ethics of virtual reality. So that will shortly be on the webpage and I will, I will also announce it in various social media. So once again, thanks for to everyone. Thanks for attending and see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.